Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 11. Now, no discipline seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, after it yields, that's discipline, the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it, and that it is discipline. God loves those he disciplines, says the Bible. Post-modern psychological parenting is a fraud. Dr. John Redmond, who I think has written the best material you'll ever find on how to be a biblical parent. He was a PhD in psychology, but he realized that all the ideas of postmodern psychology, what is that? Postmodern believes there's no absolutes. They believe everything is relative. They believe that a child is born and the child is pure and perfect. It is the parents because they're messed up. Parents mess up their children because they were been messed up by their parents and their parents messed up them. And it's gone all the way down the line, even in DNA. And therefore to be saved in postmodernism is to go to a counselor to go to a professional secular psychologist and let this secular psychologist walk you through your life, Freudian style, and you'll begin to pick up, well, this happened there, and this happened over there, and my mother, my dad, and this and that and the other, trying to explain you and trying to explain me through postmodern psychology. And it is an ongoing affair. You'll need counseling for the rest of your life to pick out all the things that made you like you are, and their basic theory is determinism. You don't have free will. Everything is really determined by environment, by background, by parents, by other influences, other events in your life. That's postmodernism. Christianity says that a baby was born and is in the image of God, but that baby lives in a fallen world, and that baby, therefore, is a fool. We talked about that if you were here last week. What is a fool? A fool is somebody that does not know what is best for them. Want to debate that? Sure, that's a fool. And therefore, a lot of us are fools because we do things, say things, have done things, have said things that was not the best for us right? It's called rebellion. And therefore, we are saved not by ourselves. We know that we confess that we were born in sin and that we have sin, and we turn away from all of that in our life and ask Jesus Christ to make us brand new. We need, the phrase is, be born again, a fresh new start. That's Christianity, a totally different view. Therefore, if we're parenting our children this way, postmodern, postmodern parenting way, or we're parenting our children according to God's principles, God's way, as taught in his book. And I have looked at verse after verse after verse after verse, and I've seen so many verses, so many lifestyle situations that teach us through that book how to be a mom and how to be a dad. Now, let me say something up front to make every parent mad. If you're not mad at this, you didn't hear this. And I'm going to end up here. If you have a problem with one of your children, the problem is not with the child, it's with mom and dad. If your children are making you uptight, uneasy about something, you've got this thing mixed up. You see, when problems come up in the disciplinary area of children, 
The pain that the parents feel has to be transferred to the child. And that's what discipline does. And we have to understand that if we're going to be effective parents. And therefore, there is a couple of types of parenting I want us to look at. First of all, there is that up-close parenting. There is that nearsighted parenting. Mothers are very, very skilled at this. There are some nearsighted parents who just deal with that which is right now. Homework! Oh, I want to make sure that, that Billy, he, he, is, he is seven. He has to get all of his homework exactly right. And I'm going to help him and tutor him and check it to make sure it's turned in. And you do that on and on and on again because you want him to be a student. You want him to be a student. And so you go on and on and never do you allow your child to turn in a homework that is not accurate or is not checked. And when they get in trouble, you're always there taking the place. You want your child to be happy, accepted, have as little pain as possible, not go through the things you went through as a child. And so you are there micromanaging your child, micromanaging your child. Every micromanager, whether it's in the business world or the family world, are always tense and uptight. You're, you're, every little thing is catastrophic. Everything is catastrophic. Every thing is an Armageddon. And this is when a mom and even a dad can be so involved. Your children sometimes need to experience the pain the results of poor choices they make. Now we move from nearsighted parenting, we move there to what? Farsighted parenting. You see the end, the goal that is out there. I want to ask you a question. 30 years from now, your son or your daughter, let's say you have a son, that son finishes the university, makes good grades, goes with the corporation, rises to the top, becomes a CEO. Oh, how proud I am of my boy. He's 30 and he's already CEO of this corporation. Oh, he's really got it. The only problem is he's already divorced from his wife. He's sending money so she can bring up the kids. He's a womanizer. He thinks the whole world revolves around him, his success, his money, and it's all about me. That's your boy, 30 years. Boy, upward success. Now you have a daughter. She knows God. She knew God had a plan for her life. She has a gift of teaching. And now she's been teaching in the school, and boy, she is contagious to the kids. They love her. She speaks truth into them, information and the word of Christ. She's not worried about getting married. She may or may not. That's no big deal. She has a call of God to invest God in Christ and information in the area of her discipline in the life, that son or daughter. Which one of those kids that you rather have, the boy or the girl? Easy answer, isn't it? But we are shooting for like the boy. And therefore, we are trying to micromanage our kids so they'll be on that road to human success. And I can tell you, for every person who is fabulously, humanly successful, once in a while they stay and walk with God, but so many times they go the very opposite direction. They're caught up and bought by the world. Look at the long picture, folks for the goal out there, for the goal that's out there. That's G-O-A-L, goal. Now, let's just get real, 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 real practical. In disciplinary matters, you say, well, you got a problem of your kids when they come in from school, they take off their shoes, throw them on the floor, throw their jacket over here, 
go upstairs, undress, take all their school clothes off, throw them on the floor everywhere, and they get redressed, and you tell them, go pick up your clothes. Well, they don't do it. Well, you say a loud, go, go pick up your clothes. They don't do it. You say it loud, and maybe they pick up part of them. What in the world are you going to do? How are you going to discipline them? Tell you something. What you do, you go and pick up all their clothes and put everything where it belongs. Shoes, satchel, whatever. Then you take that son or daughter with you and say, I want you to go with me. This is where your shoes belong. You got it? Yeah, yeah. I put them there, right? Yeah. This is where your coat, your sock, everything you go through and you walk around and show them firsthand as if they didn't know where everything belongs. Okay? And then you say, next time I say, pick up your clothes, I want you to put all those clothes right back where they belong. Not part of them, some of them, all of them. If you do not, here's what's going to happen. Saturday, you're going to stay in your room. You're going to stay right here. I'm taking away all of your equipment, iPads, phone, computers. And by the way, you don't discipline proportionately to that which they've done wrong. Now, follow me here. If a scale of 1 to 10, the worst thing is a 10, and let's say they do a 3, you punish them on the basis as if they'd done a 6. Well, boy, you're over-punishing me. All I did was, you know, steal $5 out of your pocketbook. No, 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 no. You punish much more than that which was rebuked and gone against. And that way, you see, you're beginning to train. You got me? Basic thing, we had a couple in our church, they moved to another city, great family, had three kids, tremendous Christian couple. And, and they set a rule that when you have a birthday party as a young child, when you get all your presents, you can keep only two of your presents that you get at a birthday. All the rest of them we're gonna give to goodwill. That's what they did, they'd have a birthday party, they'd pick out two, they'd give all the rest of the presents to goodwill. Now. Also, there was a rule that when I, they told them to pick up their toys, any toys they left out, they would give to Goodwill. And one night, true story, I'm not making it up, one night, the little boy named Mike was praying, and they prayed together at night, and he was praying for his mom, his dad, his sister, and his brother. He was praying for his teachers. He was praying for everything, and he prayed for Goodwill. And he continued to pray, and he said, Lord, uh, I want to be a, a fine person like goodwill, so I won't have to keep giving him all my toys. <laughs> you see, parents, there's a lot of ways to discipline your children with love and redemption. Say, so, well, I want my children to be happy. Listen, when you discipline them, they won't always be happy. You're not in the business of having a happy child. You're in the business of having a child grow up to be like God designed them, and it's expensive to do that, and you won't always be popular, and you won't always be the best friend with your daughter or with your son. You see, a lot of people don't discipline. They just pay off the child, bribe the child. If you'll do this, I'll give you that, or if we go over here. I'll... Listen, that is the most Ignorant, foolish, non-biblical way to bring up a child than you can imagine. Now, somebody might say, here's an eight-year-old. Man, he is sarcastic. He is mean. He is vicious. He pays no attention. We tried everything in the world. There's nothing in the world that we can do with him. He's eight years old, and it's just, he's just a disaster. What can I do? Dr. Redmond said a good idea was to be take that young rebellious king out of the garden and put him in the briar patch. And the way you do that, you take everything that is theirs, everything in that room that is theirs, take it out of the room, every single thing, and store it somewhere. All they've got is their bed and the clothes they'll wear the next day. Everything else is removed. And say, that will last for a month, son. Woo-hoo-hoo, pretty heavy. You will get one of your lesser possessions back every day for a month. 
And if, as long as you are perfect in being obedient and respectful and honest within this family. But once you fail, bang! We go back down, it goes back into the closet, and we start a period over again. That's severe. Children, by definition, do not know what is best for them. And when you and I fall and fumble, we are being childish because that means at that moment, we didn't know what was best for us. Operative principle, parents, this is it. If you are having trouble with your child, you say, my child is giving me trouble. The problem is not with the child, it is with you as a parent. You say, well, the psychologist said that this child has, and they have all kinds of chemical imbalances they can treat only with heavy medication. There may be situations like that, but they are rare and not as prominent as the secular psychologists would have us to believe. Parenting. Parenting. Sometimes, Nearsighted parenting had to stay in there close. Most of the time, it is far-sighted parenting with a goal in mind, and parents be willing to pay the price. It's easier to bribe. It's easier to give in. It's easier to say yes than it is to get down in the trench and try to love that child all the way to God and all the way to life that is worthwhile and beautiful and fulfilling. I was eating in Myrtle Beach years ago in a restaurant named Aunt Maud's Seafood and Country Cooking Restaurant. You can't get a better name for a restaurant than that in my book. And as I was waiting in line, and restaurants like that, you always wait in line, incidentally, the owner came out. He was speaking to us, and I was sitting in a rocker, and he came down, and a rocker came by and he sat down, and we began to talk. He said, I want to tell you a story. You may know about it a little bit. I was pastor in Columbia, South Carolina then. And he told me this story, and I've never, never, never forgotten it. He said it's about Rusty Welburn. Rusty Welburn, a year or so before, had gone on a crime spree through the whole state of South Carolina, burning, destroying, attacking, beating up, until finally he killed a beautiful young 19-year-old girl. He was prosecuted, death penalty. I don't think anybody who knew him or any member of the family were there in the courtroom when he was being tried. And this owner said, Rusty was sentenced to death row, and he was there for five years. But he said, I want to tell you what just happened and what happened in those five years he was there. Said he was hopeless, helpless. He said his story was a tragic story. He's brought up in West Virginia in the poorest of the poorest of family, numerous children. He didn't know who his daddy was, his mother had all kind of diseases, and he, he just existed. Hated by almost everybody, a little bully. In junior high school, he, had, he wore for three years one pair of pants and two shirts. The teachers didn't like him. He didn't like anybody. He fought all the time. He's rejected. Tragic story in West Virginia. When he got in the ninth grade, Rusty dropped out of school. He lived under bridges and fields, public restrooms, would steal what he needed to eat, would steal what he wanted, would fight, drugs, alcohol, you name it. He would on this spree through South Carolina kill this young girl, now he was in death row. At the same time, there was a man named Bob McAllister. He was the associate chief of staff for the governor of the state of South Carolina. And the governor's office was close to the state prison. 
And Bob was a Christian. He said, I want to do something at lunch and have a minister in the prison. So he started going to the prison, which he could, had permission because of his affair with the state. And he would go every day during lunchtime. He would visit those on death row. He said the first time he went into Rusty's cell, he was there by himself. He said he was lying in the corner in the fetal position, unmoving. He said the cell was stitched and so the only thing moving were roaches that were crawling over Rusty, and he said he didn't even notice the, the brush one of them off. Said he went over there to him and told him he was a Christian, there was hope for him, that Paul had killed a lot of Christians through his leadership, and that God could forgive him. And he said, I read a little Bible. Said Rusty just opened his eyes and closed them, never said a word. Bob said, I went there week after week after week and had no response, found the same kind of person who was hopeless and helpless. He said, finally, one day I went in and he opened his eyes and I told him how God, though he'd committed this heinous crime, could forgive him and he could be a new person. And though he was on death row, he'd have some kind of purpose in his life. And he said, he listened and suddenly for the first time, he broke down and began to cry. He began to cry, conviction. And he said, when he got through crying, he prayed to receive Jesus in his life. He had no hope, no future, nobody cared a hoot about him. Nobody, even who had known him before, knew probably he's in prison. And he said, Bob left. He came back the next week. He said, in there was Rusty sitting in a chair. He was a brand new person. He was smiling and said, I think God has really forgiven me. I feel like a new person. So Bob McAllister, in the next three or four years, went there twice a week, read the Bible to him, discipled him. And he said, Rusty felt so guilty. He was trying to figure out how he could make restitution for all the people he'd robbed and hit and beaten, and especially to the family of that little girl that he had killed. And he said, of all things, that little girl's brother became a Christian. And he had so hated Rusty because this was the young man who killed his sister. But he decided that he must forgive Rusty. And so he wrote Rusty a letter in prison. Rusty was thrilled. And he scribbled back a note and said, you know, I'm a Christian. And this brother said, I want to come and see you. So it was arranged. Can you imagine? Here's the brother who'd become a Christian who'd so hated the person who killed his sister, rightly so. And now he was coming to see him with his wife. Bob McAllister set it up. He said, I was there when we opened the cell. It said they were rushing each other's arm, just weeping, weeping, weeping. And that brother said, I forgive you. And Rusty said, I, I don't see how you can. Speed up the time a little bit. It was a day for Rusty to be executed for his crime. He'd not tried to get out. He told McAllister, he was looking forward to dying because for the first time, he'd have a family. He'd have a family. So Bob was with him. The execution was 1, 1 a.m. in the morning. Bob went with him early in the evening. He said, Rusty, what do you want to do? And he said, Bob, I'm going to lie on my cot here, look forward to going to my family I've never had. Read the Bible to me and pray. Read to me about heaven. And Bob said he did it line upon line, verse upon verse, until he looked over there and Rusty appeared to be asleep. He said he stopped reading and praying and went over there and got a little blanket and covered him with a blanket. He called for the jailer to open the door and he was going out and he said, he didn't know why. He said, I just turned around and kissed Rusty on the forehead and the jailer let me out and I left. A couple of hours later, Rusty was being carried away to his execution. And as he was going away, he talked to the person who was going out and said, you know, it's a shame that a man has to live to be 23 years of age, that the last night he's on this earth, he was kissed and tucked in for the first time. Dads, when a mother is a Christian, 
statistically, 17% of the time the kids will become a Christian. When the dad is a Christian in the family, 93% of the time the kids become a Christian. The shrinking father, kiss, tuck in your kids every night and you'll be a parent who understands how to love and discipline and keeps your eye as a far-sighted parent on the goal that God has and you must have for that son and that daughter. And that is character and Christ. 